into fiction. Okay. It follows that it cannot be our task to find an absolutely correct theory of fiction. Luis Del Pino. Yes. I'm I'm in I'm in the Zoom meeting and so you can join me by typing in my phone number and no password. Isn't that wonderful? Well well it'll take you to a it'll take you to like a, a waiting room and then I'll let you in for security. Okay, bye. simple as possible and that represents phenomena as accurately as possible. One might even conceive of two quite different theories, both equally simple and equally common. Luis Del Pino is going to join us. The assertion that a good theory is the only correct one to express our subjective conviction that there could not be another equally simple and fitting image.6. In summary, let's see. I'm going to start a hello friends and enemies and um, Facebook friends and enemies. Oh, what happened? I'm waiting for a friend. Hmm. Uh, I'm waiting for Luis Del Pino to join us. Let's see, it's a Zoom meeting. And the topic is going to be on the, on the philosophy of science. We're gonna discuss an article that we were supposed to read called Boltzmann's, Boltzmann's, I just woke up. Concept of reality. So I'm going to admit my friend Luis Del Pino. Mm. Okay, there. There he is. Luis! Oh. Wait a minute. How's that? Oh. Wait a minute. Uh, speakers. Hello. Wait a minute. Unmute. Mm. Mm. Unmute audio. Oh, good morning. <gasps> Luis. I was muted. I'm sorry. I'm uncouth. You were muted. You unmuted yourself. Just like trying, that. I was trying to unmute you. From here, but, <laughs> oh, but I can I can mute you. You like, can mute me, uh, yeah. or I can mute you, unmute you. Uh, also with a with a oops, with a keyboard, I can go Alt A destroy. Alt me. <laughs> Alt A destroy. <laughs> Alt A uh, mute me. And go Alt from stun. What's it? Oh, a uh, mutes or unmutes me. It this reminds me of uh, uh, what, what was the Toy Stories, uh, <laughs> the spaceman, uh, and he says, "Go from no set set from uh, stun to kill <laughs> with his toy gun." <laughs> we could destroy the world with this toy here. <laughs> well, good morning. We are. Uh, we are we, ready to go. Do you get the feel that uh, David is not going to join us today? Because he said he could not host, but he did not say he could not attend. Oh, that's good. There's hope. Uh -huh. I men mentioned it to Rami. And uh, how was how was the meeting yesterday? By the way, I mentioned it to uh, a guy named I forgot his name. Oh, Mike Cordero at a at a meetup yes last night. 
Rami and I attended a meetup. Yes. Uh, with the Stoics, with Dan Stoic. And How so, did that go? And so, and so I mentioned it to Mike Cordero. He might enjoy it. I don't know. If well, I, if what was the what was the the subject of the meeting? It was something. Oh, oh, Epi, Epitectus, Epitectus, Epictetus, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Epictetus, it was. Uh, it Listen, was, you need to. Uh, we need to go ahead and invite the. Uh, I'm gonna do that on my phone while I. Hold on a second. I'm not going anywhere. I'm gonna invite uh, Francisco. Hi, Francisco. Francisco, Francisco. Oh, I spelled it wrong. Uh, 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 join, join Zoom 407, 407 dash uh, 486 dash. Oh, you don't need, you don't need the dash, but yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, 407. But, but can you remind me the number? Uh, 486. Uh, and, no, wait a minute. 407 486 8642. That's my phone number. Have, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. It's okay, the, here we go. I sent him a little WhatsApp. 407 486 8642. Perfect. Let's see if we, uh, if we have the pleasure. And what about David? You need to uh, wake him up, or. But by the way, what is the the subject of the day? Yes, we we uh, we're going to uh, discuss uh, Boltzmann's concept of reality. Ah. It could be too deep for this uh, <laughs> Saturday morning. Yes, we're in the deep. Uh, but, but uh, I I didn't read it uh, five times. But I I I listened and read it once. <laughs> then I'm very curious, very curious to to uh, to know what you th what you uh, think of what these two guys wrote about Boltzmann. Uh, what what is your impression? Yes, I I sense that he that he um he he was trying to make science more uh open minded and less dogmatic less and, dogmatic and he was trying to get scientists to say okay so you don't like this theory and you like that theory so that doesn't mean you should uh let go of this theory because uh, it has of, of either of them, of it, either of them, it's uh, it has its what both of them have their value and their perspective, they can describe reality as a whole from a different angle. Yes, each theory is what uh, is not completely right and not completely wrong. It, each theory is like a representation of reality because you can't uh say that a theory is reality each theory is is uh, a representation is, is our is very good is so our, is, is is our uh, a helpful image or whatever right. yeah to help us understand reality to help us use reality to help uh mankind deal with reality but it's not reality so we should itself the a theory with reality and say okay this is the best reality so we should uh, erase all the. That other. is correct. That is correct. Uh, so you 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 got it. All realities, even 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 that even the reality, the theory of the of of uh, that the Earth is flat. That's that could be considered a reality that works for uh, uh, a very short uh, distance. I can see. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. Works for us. So. That's right. The, the Earth is flat as far as you're concerned. If you only look at the uh, hundred square feet. Even the in even in the early Buddhist uh, uh, or there's the practice of offering the world uh, to the Buddhas and it, it, it imagines 
the, the uh, reality or the earth as something like a flat table and there's things on top of it and things underneath it. <laughs> so you, 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 got, you got the gist of it for sure. But uh, what uh, one thing that I really uh, liked about that was precisely that openness that uh, what I, I, I call uh, quite often anymore perspectivism. Because one of the problems that the human mind has in understanding reality is a narrow, a narrow uh, scope. So if we look at things too closely, too narrowly, we miss the big picture. And then we make decisions that are inappropriate. We, we, we get all uptight. We don't, we, are, we don't have this flexibility of perspective. Um, the, so that's, that's the first thing. Relax. It is what it is. Reality is what it is. Let's look at it from uh, a distance. We, let's not get too close to it because then you, you, we get the tanha, the, the thirst feeling uh, for being and non-being, uh, for the sensory. We get too attached to our sensory impressions. Uh, and we are not able to detach. Uh, in French, they say, prendre du recul to step back, to look at reality and be able to study it in it all its wholeness, in oneness, in its integrity. So when we do that, we're able to better, I would say, deliberate, better think, better better uh, cognate, and, and not make mistakes with our emotions and impulses. So this uh, anti-dogmatism, this uh, push towards uh, perspectivism, openness, flexibility of views is something that I really uh, right away connected, uh, I, I connected with. Uh, it is very reminiscent of E. O. Wilson, who talks about consilience. Um, mm -hmm. I always mention him because he says that uh, one cannot know uh, uh, anything uh, from only one perspective. In order to know something very well, you have to use it. Uh, a variety of different perspectives and sciences, uh, different angles, so you you know it well, you understand it uh, fully. So th in that regard, I was already making the, the, the parallel. So openness of views, uh, a uh, uh, diverse this diversification of your your perspectives in understanding anything in this universe that is infinite and eternal. So. Uh, I, I found it extremely refreshing. Now we have to understand too that he, uh, this uh, Boltzmann guy, uh, was uh, under a lot of duress because he had it clear in his mind that uh, the universe was made of uh, tiny atoms, and that went against uh, the the pervading scientific view. Uh, that uh, the the universe was energy, but it was not quantized. So he he had a very big battle, because in his mind he was absolutely uh, convinced that uh, gases, for example, which was his his big stuff, uh, were uh, composed of very tiny tiny uh, particles, molecules. Um, uh, and, and atoms, I don't know if he knew the distinction between atoms and molecules. I, I don't know. I haven't studied enough in that. But he knew that things were broken down into individual little particles. And he uh, hypothesized that uh, the temperature of a gas in a specific place was the, directly due to the kinetic energy of each one of the particles. And he did averages and co computations. And he came to the conclusion that uh, within a, a certain volume with a certain amount of molecules flying around or, you know, moving around the space, uh, it would be determining the pressure, the temperature. And, and uh, he could compute the average uh, speed of movement of uh, a molecule in, uh, in, in the air and, you know, the speeds are stag staggering at the room temperature. Uh, I just read this morning that uh, a, a molecule of nitrogen uh, travels at 900 and something feet per second or something crazy. I mean, uh, extremely uh, high speeds on an average. 
in, of course, because they're so small, when they impact us, because right now there's air molecules impacting on my, on my skin, uh, they are so small that we, we only feel the average kinetic energy of the whole uh, trillions of molecules flying around us. And uh, uh, that average of that kinetic energy gives the temperature of the room at the given pressure. That's the, that is phenomenal. Uh, you know, a uh, hundred and some years ago, uh, this guy was already in his mind understanding this dynamic uh, play of molecules and particles, and everybody was looking at it like it was absolutely crazy. Oh, you mentioned uh, consilient, the unit yes. knowledge by a, a uh, Edward Osborne Wilson. Yes. Why, why do you find that book uh, uh, v valuable to your uh, to your view of how to deal with reality? I discovered Wilson after I had spent a lot of time studying by myself um, the issues or ideas or questions about uh, life and what should I do, how should I live, how should I feel, uh, what is the right thing, what is the wrong thing, what is practical, what is not. And I had been spending, spending quite a bit of time reading. I started reading uh, the different uh, spiritual Bibles, and then I read the uh, many, many philosophers, and then I ended up uh, discovering Buddhism, the Dharma, or Dhamma. And I started making my own world vision. I discovered that I needed to precisely uh, understand statements or conclusions from other thinkers uh, with a very open perspective, because some of the things that I read made no sense whatsoever at the beginning. And then as I changed my views or my perspectives, I could find sense in them, but only from that perspective. So what doesn't make any sense from perspective A makes a heck of a lot of sense from perspective Z. So if you uh, use A and Z, then you are able to see a concept, an idea, a belief, or a feeling, or uh, a truth uh, much better. Because you can say, yes, uh, this is uh, this truth that we're talking about, but this truth from this angle makes a lot of sense from this angle, doesn't make any sense. So you, it helps you uh, make your thinking dynamic. And after I had come to this conclusion, I bumped on this, the uh, Wilson, E.O. Wilson, that says, that kind of coined the, 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 the term consilience, which is to use uh, uh, a priori very different sciences like physics and uh, uh, psychology, for example, two, two completely different sciences, physics and psychology. One just measures what is, the other one measures how we feel, how we think about what is. And in the combination of two apparently absolutely different sciences that have nothing to do with each other, when you can, can find concealments between them, then you understand any uh, uh, idea or, or conception or term that is pinned between them. And <clears throat> what he, he wrote a book in, in, in which he has a, a little diagram and it has a point in the middle, it has like a, a square with four subsquares. And in, in the middle, there is a concept, an idea or so, something that we're discussing. And then each one of the squares is different sciences like, uh, I don't know, climate science, economics, uh, physics, and uh, psychology, or, you know, something like that. And he says that the more we go uh, closer to the, the, the theme at hand, uh, the less each one of the sciences is involved in it. It's just like, you know, 
what is in in psychology does not pertain to uh, physics. But as you go wider in your understanding and you go wider in your perspective, all of a sudden the same point that you are analyzing now is involved in both sciences. You're able to kind of bounce off you know, from the physical point, from the psychological point, from the climate science point, from the economics point, et cetera, et cetera. I'm trying to look for a word that describes that, that's used more in politics. Uh, so, something that, that uh, when, when uh, Barack Obama became president, he, he was trying to make it his, um, an effort of, of, of going across the aisle and bringing them in. What is that called? What or you? There is a word in politics that they use that is. Uh, uh, well, I, I, it will come back, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Or you're trying to to bring them in and, and not not necessarily negotiate. It's funny, no, no, because it's a it's a word. When you hear it, it makes it sound like you do not cooperate on both sides of the aisle. But that's what. It, it is it is uh, talking about uh, using both sides of the aisle to create or generate the policy or a change uh, in the law but then the problem is then then the then your constituent or or or, or people looking back in history and said ah oh, he 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 went on their side and did that's right for uh, what we wanted and, and that's right wanted. that's right <laughs> But, it's, uh, in, in science and in what? Well, I, I would say that a good word to use other than concealing is that, that people uh, typically haven't uh, bumped uh, against or they haven't studied it or they don't understand it very well. Uh, um, we could use the word a, a super perspective, you know, like a, a omni perspective. So looking at any phenomenon from an array of different perspectives. Well, there's a definition in a dictionary for consilience. It says agreement between the approaches to a topic of different academic subjects. So you're agreeing, uh, looking at all the different approaches, uh, uh, all the different academic sciences and trying to come to some agreement, especially in science and humanities. And it sounds like from the article, uh, Boltzmann's concept of reality, that, that he was try trying to do that because, because yeah, I imagine at that time, that was before uh, Einstein uh, theory of reality and, and the uh, ideas uh, of, uh, of the um, what is it, uh, quantum and and other things they were starting to think about, and so maybe they were arguing. There were uh, philosophers versus scientists. Well, well, philosophers that were involved in science were were promoting the that that there there shouldn't be uh, atoms, and then scientists that were that were uh, using data or were trying to show that there are atoms as things. And maybe uh, this Boltzmann uh, was trying to do some kind of consilience. Without uh, a doubt, without a doubt. That's why I think that he didn't use that word, but uh, he was talking exactly about that. He was trying to tell the philosopher scientists, the, I guess the idealist kind of, scientists versus the the realist kind of scientists like the realist kind of scientists were were promoting that atoms do exist as uh, as inherently existent objects and idealist kind of scientists were trying to say no there's no that there's no such thing as atoms or, or, or maybe it's just energy or something else and so he was trying to come to uh, uh, or trying to satisfy both sides he was trying to say that that okay you you idealist go go ahead and continue that way but but think of 
Oh, you're back. Oh, I have to click on admit. Yeah, the the boatswain was trying to tell the idealist philosopher scientist to not uh, get stuck on that there isn't atoms, but to treat uh, the uh, the idea of atoms as as a model that that will help uh, deal with uh, experiments and go ahead and continue. Uh, not not having to believe, but just treat it as as a a model, a rep, a representation, perhaps that that might work in doing in running experiments, and then and that maybe that was kind of his consilience or to try to bring bring the other side in. He went across the aisle. <laughs> oh, I forgot, or I'm still having. Oh, you're you're muted. <laughs> or maybe I have to unmute you. Let's see. I'm uh, sorry, I was. Oh, now I unmuted you. <laughs> say, no, say. I'm sorry. I, I disconnected without. Uh, I didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> then when I came in, but I was going to say that the the um, partisan is the the word that they use yeah. in politics. A partisan yeah. effort. So basically, two two uh, uh, opposite poles in politics that make an effort together but it's partisan because each one each party has their own thing so but they, they come together so partisan to me sounds like uncooperative you know only from one side from one party but partisan effort is when they, they both work together across the aisle so yeah so so Boltzmann was was trying to uh work across the aisle to bring the idealist philosopher scientist over to the idea that that okay so don't accept that atoms exist but at least treat it as a as a model as a as a theory and so maybe that's what he went into as a workable perspective yeah to treating theories not as 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 real but as dogmas models right. as a, as a representations as Mm -hmm. what, what I find so beautiful in this kind of thinking, uh, whether it is from Boltzmann or from, uh, from uh, Wilson in this case, is that in my own personal experience, after spending a lot of time thinking about different, different uh, ideas, problems, objects, phenomena, I came to the conclusion that the application of consilience or partisanship in our own understand our own representation of life, because you know you and I are not uh, scientists, so but we still deal with reality just like scientists do. But scientists do deal with reality with very uh, specific items, mm -hmm. topics. I want to know what the temperature is doing. Why, when I put my hand in a hot pot, uh, do I get burned? what is happening there. So they're very specific in what they analyze. But you and I, we deal with reality in a heuristic kind of way. Ah, let's make it simple. Let's not complicate ourselves much. If it feels good, uh, if, if it's okay, if I'm okay with that, that's what, that's what I understand. That's what I, mm -hmm. I decide. And that's the way I live. So we are, in a way, amateur scientists representing reality Maybe not with formulas, but you could say that our behavior, our conduct, our life, the way we behave, our character, the way we interact with things and people are our formulas, yeah. unscientific formulas to represent what is, which is reality as a whole. Yeah. And, and my discovery has been that if I use this kind of approach, the Boltzmann approach or the Wilson approach, in my, the way I... I look at my cup of coffee or the way I drink coffee or the way I talk to you, the way I, I position my light, the way I eat, the way I sleep, the way I uh, go to work, the way I buy groceries at the store, the way I drive on I-4, all that, this openness of, okay, let's consider the following and look at it from different perspectives helps, is it brings on phronesis, the, the, the Greek word for, um, practical wisdom which then reverts remember the trickle down wisdom 
this this uh, practical wisdom reverts into all the pyramid of the Maslow's pyramid that goes down all the way down to the what I eat, who I I, I live with, uh, how I conduct myself, if I watch TV or I don't watch TV, if I spend my time doing one thing or the other, if I do exercise or don't exercise, if I become a vegan versus a, a meat eater, right. et cetera, et cetera. So all of that has been, I can confirm in my own life. Hi. Welcome, Mike. Unmute yourself. <laughs> He's outside. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning, Mike. How are you? We are living science fiction. Are you in oh. Chicago or something like that? I'm in Chicago. Wow. wow that's nice. Nice this background, amazing. by the way. Nice background. Look at that. that There's a beautiful yeah, tree. Are you on a, on a phone or something? I'm on my deck. My deck. On your back. deck. That's that your backyard? Yeah. Are you wow. using a, a laptop? I, actually, an iPad. An iPad. Oh, that's well, cool. it's it's. Uh, I'm glad it's that you pretty. you. Thanks you for could, inviting. Thank you for no, inviting. I'm very glad that you could join. That you could uh, get on this one. This one is a good. We we started just a few minutes ago. Uh, <clears throat> Jairo and and myself. Uh, Jairo is hosting. Uh, I have invited Francisco, but he hasn't shown up yet. And David uh, Norton who has been uh, present uh, previously is, I don't think he's going to make it today. I don't know why, but we are talking about a beautiful, um, a beautiful idea. Um, I think I, I shared it with you yesterday. The, <clears throat> this uh, short uh, writing about the Boltzmann uh, concept of reality. Boltzmann was a 19th century physicist and mathematician. He became very, very famous. He had a very tough time in his life. As a matter of fact, he, he committed suicide when I was, he was uh, 60 little. Um, he, he had bouts of depression and everything, but he was a genius. The guy was a genius. And he was one of the first uh, physicists to uh, have the intuition that reality was made of tiny little particles. Particles. So the, uh, the yeah, particles, uh, the atoms, molecules, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, of course, uh, at the time, uh, he was way ahead of his time, so of course he suffered for it. He was ridiculed. He he had a lot of opposition, and uh, he he had a very tough time. He had a very tough time because for most of his life, uh, in the academic world, although he was recognized as a freaking genius, his most fundamental ideas about the nature of reality, which is what. Uh, uh, us guys talk about most of the time in non-scientific terms, more into philosophical and psychological terms. He he had a, a, a very very big opposition, was never recognized until his death, and then, lo and behold, uh, right after his death, uh, Planck himself, uh, 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 Max Planck, uh, recognized him as a freaking genius, and he said, "Yes, he was right all along." That's the way, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 quant, the quanti, uh, quantum nature of reality. He was already into in, uh, that. But what I was interested in, and uh, I kind of study his, his uh, character. Louis, I, I'm so sorry. I've got a, just the dog is barking and it's waking up neighbors. I'll be right back. Sorry. Go ahead, go ahead. I hate to interrupt. Oh, wonder if I can, no, I can't. I'm going to. I'm gonna try to call. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to call um, Rami. Let's see if I can call Rami or David. Let's see. So I, I will continue what you, you and I were talking about, which is that I. It is my personal experience. Oh, you're back. So. Um, I discovered this uh, little uh, essay. Non-scientific language. Uh, and the ideas of Planck, uh, of uh, Boltzmann, I'm sorry. And uh, he, uh, even shared some of uh, his, uh, his writings. 
And in them, uh, I immediately uh, saw a lot of uh, myself or my ideas, not in scientific terms, but in philosophical terms. Uh, mm -hmm. And one of them, one of the most important things, in, and Jairo agreed with me, that he talks about uh, uh, um, uh, openness of, of mind. He talks about uh, uh, getting away from uh, um, uh, dogmatism. He talks about how every physical, uh, 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 every theory, uh, scientific theory, is a representation of reality, uh, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what is, the, the real real is that, and then we can represent ourselves that reality, and then we try to make sense of it. So I immediately felt very comfortable with that because, uh, and you and I have discussed Wilson, E.O. Wilson and consilience, that is looking at any phenomenon. And when I say phenomenon, I'm talking about a, an object or an idea, because an idea is a phenomenon or a feeling or an emotion or anything. And look at it from uh, the, the, an open, a super perspective, uh, mm -hmm. which in, 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 uh, includes many different uh, 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 angles and sciences. And, and, you know, a fact can be analyzed from many different ways. And the more, the more ways you look at it, the different angles you look at it, the more open-minded you are and the, you better understand it. Do we so agree? Fell... Sorry? Question. Can I ask a question? Yes. Unless you want to continue along. No, no, no. That, that was it. That was it. Go ahead. So, so what is these aspects of reality, the aspects of reality that the, the, the model that you're describing, like for, so that there, there are many different, so to be open-minded, meaning that there are many different aspects of reality. There are many different ways to look at the different aspects of reality. But there's only but, one? Well, there's only one reality, obviously. The same tree that is behind you, we look mm -hmm. at the same tree. There's one tree there. Now, what we feel about the tree, how we think about it, how we analyze it, is it good, is it bad, is it beautiful, is it ugly, uh, what is it made of, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the different representations sure. exactly. of what is behind you. So, so for so, example, a biologist, a physicist, a painter, an impressionist, completely different. And a psychologist and a philosopher and everything. So, this reminds yes. me of the uh, the fable of the uh, the elephant and the three blind men. So one is Absolutely. feeling one is feeling the trunk and uh, sees it sees a snake. The other one is feeling the tail. Sees a, uh, a uh, horse, and the other is uh, feeling the uh, the leg and the the ear and thinks it's a tree. That's a very good, uh, is it very good imagery. Oh, yeah. It's the same thing. And uh, you, you make it very clear right there yeah. that if you uh, only focus on one as a, a one perspective of that phenomenon, you miss out on the big picture and you make decisions and you, you do actions that are uh, flawed because you don't realize you're dealing with an elephant. You think you're dealing with, I don't know, uh, a piece of rope with hair at the end. Now, the interesting part of that is if the three men were to that, be able to communicate with one another as we are, they would understand by putting these pieces together that this, in fact, is an element. Absolutely beautiful analogy because as you are saying, three men to get looking at an elephant, see the elephant much better than one, uh, one man. So now I take this further. If I can look at reality, the whole of reality, life, life, uh, as you and as uh, Jairo and as myself and as Francisco and as David and the other guy and the other guy, the other guy, my perspective becomes almost universal. So I take everybody's theory uh, mine, I'm uh, representing, talking about. So I become a, a multi-mind. 
in analyzing an object. So your, your imagery is very, very good, Mike. This is very interesting, and I think this is uh, also a pattern in, in nature. The, 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 uh, it's pattern in terms of anthropology and archaeology. For example, if we look at a Mayan ruin in the Yucatan Peninsula, we see that you know, the same type of architecture that was being formulated in Egypt, for example. And uh, it's that idea of uh, perhaps the way that we evolve as human beings. After all, we do all come from Africa. So there is one particular, we come from one particular uh, biology, one shared biology. So it's very interesting to me, and it's always interesting that our family from Africa, uh, you know, where are you from? Well, my, my family's from Africa. You know, who are you? you know, and that's always, very, that's very interesting to me. But anyway, so we, we disperse throughout the, the world, and we come up with the same... <laughs> Somehow that 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 is that I, I that idea is, is 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 spawning from this conversation. I'm not sure why if that's making any sense. But that's no no no. It makes a hell of a lot of sense because you can take that uh, that same uh, 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 string of thought and you can go back to before we were we. Mm. You know when did man become man? Mm. You know. We always talk about uh, was the egg or the of the chi was the egg or the chicken first. Well, I can say when did the egg become an egg? When did the chicken become a chicken? And wasn't there like a, a range of becoming mm -hmm. before the chicken was a chicken? It was a pre-chicken, a pre-pre-chicken, a pre-pre. -pre -pre that didn't look like a chicken, but it was a chicken in formation. So we can take the, your analogy back to the uh, beginning of time, which has no beginning. Sure. So we are the expression of reality, again, mm -hmm. looking at itself. It's fascinating. So yeah, exactly. the wider we go, the wider we go, the more different perspectives, the more different slants and angles we use in analyzing anything, mm -hmm. any aspect of reality, the, the more it brings uh, lucidity clairvoyance in a sense and I feel that um, um, uh, there's a, a book that says many lives many masters uh, I believe that it's many lives and many minds for a super omniscience so this open-mindedness is what frees the, uh, the, uh, the, the human consciousness to truly understand the world i.e. to truly understand itself and from that understanding comes the uh, cessation of suffering. It's like, oh, I got this. So uh, uh, that, that's my experience. I knew you were going to text me, by the way, this morning. I wasn't going to bring like it that. up. Well, I knew that, and, and I'm not, uh, trust me, I'm scientific-based, but I was thinking, I'm, I was just about to, I was hoping that you would, because uh, I have a, a little bit of time this morning. This is not, this is not well, me bringing this up because... Yeah, yeah. Uh, Press Hyro and, and, and Lewis. Yeah. I'm simply saying that when I saw the text come through, and I know that maybe that's not a supernatural, but maybe there does that have anything to do with what you're describing? Well, because uh, I knew that you were going to. I was just about to contact you because I was hoping that we could do a Zoom meeting. Yeah. And and because it was the right moment. Now that I'm here, I'm like, this is so enjoyable. It is very enjoyable, and I think I just beat you to the punch. <laughs> it was going to happen no matter what. Anyway. <laughs> it just, it just so. didn't happen the way you, uh, you, uh, you, know, you thought it was going to happen, which was yeah. you calling us <laughs> instead of us calling you. It's interesting because you're bringing up so many interesting things. Um, hmm. The cognitive revolution that we talked about, they say, happened something like 70 Eighty thousand years ago, and we and, and 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 we find it in Spain, and we find it in uh, in France, right? With the art, with the artwork, the, the yes. cognitive revolution. Meaning, your question is, when did man become man? Well, we have to ask ourselves, how do you define man? That's right. And uh, you know, so it's this idea of, and and we talked a little bit about this, Hiro, which is the uh, uh, 
the mythology behind the Garden of Eden, which is this idea of being at one with everything and being at peace. And then there's this idea of wisdom or knowledge that we, our, our minds have evolved into. And then it's this idea of self. And this would be the cognitive revolution, the three major revolutions that are, are, are understood. Cognitive revolution about 70,000 years ago, the industrial revolution, which was uh, about, uh, excuse me, the, uh, uh, not the industrial revolution, the agricultural revolution, which was about 15,000 years ago. And then the uh, an information revolution, which would have happened with, uh, well, who was it, Guggenheim with the, with the printing press? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, 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 uh, those are the, those are the, the data, the, the communication the revolution. Yeah. The, the boom, boom, the, boom. And you the can, internet of the, the internet of the 15th done. century or something like that. You know, the, I don't know. Being able to print a book. So what's next? What's well, the say, next revolution? They yeah, say that something it would be, like AI yes. is embedded or that it, it's just everywhere. The internet of things is just everywhere. And with 5G connecting everything, you could even have a, a chip in a pen and just in your, in your eyeglasses. There's Google Glass that they didn't catch on. Maybe it will eventually or something like it. Mm -hmm. but, you can get information by you know, like looking in your. You know, yeah. I, I, I think you're uh, onto something. The, the, the answer to your question, from my perspective, Mike, uh, the revolution for me, for, for me uh, individually, has consisted in the following that there are two kinds of knowledge the conventional knowledge and the non conventional knowledge. Um, that non conventional knowledge which is precisely a super perspectivism of looking at any object, any knowledge, anything from a uh, omniscient kind of uh, uh, perspective um, is fed by, is fed by actually a, a conventional knowledge. So it's like a, the 1970s uh, uh, lamps, you know those lamps with the bubbles? Uh, I don't know the name of them. But... Sure, the uh, um, lava lamps. Lava, yeah, yeah. Lava lamps. So you you have. I did too many drugs. I forgot the uh, <laughs> looking at lava lamps. <laughs> but so that, that 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 is reality. So you are looking at reality in a lava lamp. You're looking at reality. Every bubble is a universe. Let's put it that way. It's a universe, uh, like our universe, that uh, comes into being and fizzles out, but doesn't go anywhere. It's still in the same lamp. It's the, it's same it's same reality. So you look in the lava lamp is a a good representation of reality, the whole universe. In within the universe, you have bubbles of reality, sub realities, which would be one of those yellow bubbles would be our universe. That's an expansion. It has a certain time span of 15 billion years, and then it may fizzle out, but it's going to come back. It's going to come back from the bottom. It didn't even go anywhere. It was still in the lamp, you know? So that's a, the circular, the yin-yang, the never-ending circle of uh, being and non-being, the rebirth, you know, the, the, uh, that uh, they talk about in Buddhism. But how can you call that rebirth? You didn't go anywhere. You just... Mm. You know, you were not phenomenal for a while, and then you became phenomenal. But your noumenal nature was inside that that reality. So, this is, to me, the more I study, the more I find Boltzmann or Planck or anything, any idea, Buddha, the Dharma, the Vedas, you and I talking about the life and work and you know, salesmanship, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, uh, it, the it, the the more you oh, have uh, conventional have a knowledge, we have a friend, uh, uh, Ken, joining us. Hey, Ken, Whoa. thanks for joining us. I muted. <laughs> oh, he's he's muted. 
I think you have the you have the power you have the power of title. You're all powerful. Am I nice. supposed to? I'm going to start nice. sharing the lava lamp. Nice. Very cool. I I was listening to some Tibetan music, mm -hmm. Tibetan bells. Oh, and, nice, oh, nice. Can, Fire. Can you unmute yourself, Ken? Yes. And, and and uh welcome ken thanks oh just kidding oh, <laughs> ken's an alternate version of mike <laughs> <laughs> i just got a haircut so you know uh, i was similar I similar, similar I like your beard. the same reality wonderful <laughs> that's it that's it both sides of the same coin good morning that's good it. morning that's good good morning ken you got a little bit more hair than I do. I don't know. I don't know. I, it's very close. It's it's well, a close it's, match. It's interesting. We were, we were just talking about the one. I come from Africa, like we all do. Our, my family comes from Africa. Um, they they left uh, a couple hundred thousand years ago, maybe maybe a hundred thousand years ago. I'm not sure. And it's yeah, good to see you. this is this is a family reunion. <laughs> so I'm so saying, have, Eve theory, yeah. mitochondrial DNA, doesn't lie. <laughs> so, <laughs> this idea of every time we see one another, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> <laughs> At least in this reality, or this that's, life. That's it. Oh. But, but, you just have amnesia. That's right. <laughs> Up until knowledge is received, that's true. I, I, I just said we were trying to figure out, because Hyro had a, uh, a lava lamp on just as you were before you came in ken and lewis said, what is that thing that they did in the 70s with the bubbles and everything and uh i couldn't <laughs> i couldn't remember it because i did way too many drugs looking at lava lamp. <laughs> you were you were inside the lava lamp mike <laughs> but i forgot what it's called. So, so when you're inside you can't see it <laughs> that's the problem <laughs> we're all lava lamps <laughs> all right so now we have uh, we have uh, 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 all four of us. Who who wants to summarize? Who wants to summarize the subject of the day? Uh, uh, we've been uh, at it for about fifty or forty some minutes. Uh, so who who wants to summarize the subject of the day? Uh, maybe Jairo, you're hosting, so go at it. Yes, it reminds me of of politics and bipartisanship and, and 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 walking across the aisle to try to get uh i'm looking for another word but but you you know what it's like and but this in this case it was happening in the early 1900s or maybe before when, when there's a uh, uh some were trying to promote uh the atomic theory and others were were trying to be more idealistic, perhaps. And so, Bolt, Boltzmann was more in favor of, of the atomic theory, but he didn't want to make it like, okay, this is this is the fact, this is the way reality is. He was trying to walk across the aisle and get the idealist to see it his way by saying, this is just a theory, just a representation, and so don't take it as so literally, but. But uh, see the benefit and, and see that it could be useful. That, that's what he was trying to do, I think. Well, if I may interrupt, what is the subject of the day? The subject of the day, maybe I'll, I'll summarize it real quick. We were talking about uh, uh, perspectivism, ah. the meaning how we individually, we individually represent lives, uh, life to ourselves and others when we talk about it and we share it. And uh, Boltzmann was very good in that sense, although he was a scientist, he was proposing that science represents reality in terms of uh, formulas or theories. And he, because he, he had so much, uh, uh, so much uh, conflict with other scientists that said, no, uh, life is not made of atoms, because at the time it, it was way ahead of his time, uh, he said, let's not be so dogmatic. 
let's agree to, de to disagree and let's use uh, different theories and different formulas to describe uh, the same concept or the same phenomenon from different perspectives. And uh, I found it very interesting. That's why I asked Jairo to, to make that the, the subject of the conversation, because we, you, Jairo, uh, Mike, and I are like scientists, non-scientists, non-scientist scientists. We are looking at reality. We live in reality. We're representing reality to ourselves to a certain degree, better or worse or whatever. And um, the more flexible our views about reality become, the better we can understand it. And the better we understand reality, the better we harmonize with reality. The better we're able to cope with driving on I-4. The, the better we are able to cope with a nasty boss. The better we're able to cope with a difficult partner or a different, uh, difficult neighborhood or a difficult society. So the more flexible we are in understanding what we uh, see as reality, the better we can harmonize with it, manage our lives, and become uh, less aggravated. It's interesting. Right? But the, when I, 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 like I said, we, we talk about different perspectives. We're talking basically about different branches of the same tree, correct? Correct. And Different that, sciences, yes. That being said, when you look at it, when you, when you, when you bring up science, uh, you know, when you, a lot of your words like flexibility and stuff like that does not apply in science. Science is not about being flexible. Science is about fact and what, what is quantifiable and what is proven. That is both its strength and its weakness as far as I see it because when, where matter ends, science is useless. That's what all about. Science is man's okay. mechanism to understand the world around him, the world that he perceives through his senses. You see? So to really understand, to go where you're going, or go where, 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 where was it, Bozeman and Tesla, where they were going, they were beyond the senses. Oh. Hawking was like that too. Yep. So uh, a, a lot of us, so in order to really, really understand the world around you, you've got to understand your place in that world around you. So by understanding you, yourself, the, it's like, you know what, I always like it is, I always use this example in my classes. Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, that album. If you look at the cover of that album, it's got the prism, and it's got the one light coming in, and it's got the rainbow coming out. Okay, now that rainbow coming out are not different lights. They're all aspects of the one light. So by understanding that one light, the aspects themselves fall into place. You don't have to understand the, the red chakra the yellow chakra, the orange, you have to understand each of them. You just understand the one light that's providing it all. You see? So that one, light, that one point is you yourself. So by understanding yourself, all of these other stuff that you're talking about falling into place will all fall into place by itself if you understand who you are and what you're about. Absolutely, 100%. You know, yeah, so talk about perspective, too. Absolutely. That's when exactly you, what this is about when you listen to dark side of the moon with headphones wow yeah <laughs> dude <laughs> i still do <laughs> i mean it is you know and that's a different that's a, ex a completely different experience than you're yep. missing out on some things uh, oh yeah in, in terms I of still, I, I still glean insights from that album <laughs> it's fantastic it's unbelievable yeah i just do it i listened to it last week with headphones yep. on, fantastic Great album. They have they have a lot now. The other one I, I've always followed and fell into Tesla because I finally understood the concepts of what he was talking about understanding reality through threes, sixes, and nines. A lot of people that throws them off, but you know, in meditation and in in in, in, in teaching, as I have, I usually get the, these kind of um, you know, I don't want to call them revelations, but I get like I kind of get downloads, and I understood the concept of what he was talking about insights, sixes, six, six, exactly threes, sixes, and nines. Now, threes, of course, is energy. That's what he's talking about. Proton, neutron, electron. That's represented in spirituality as father, son, holy spirit, Hinduism, generator, operator, destroyer, Native American, sun, earth, moon. So these are all representations of energy. And then energy that coalesces, it coalesces in the gas, it coalesces in the stars, it coalesces in the planets. Sometimes they further and coalesces into actual life. 
Those are the sixes. So when he's talking about threes and sixes, he's talking about energy to matter, to existence, and then the nines is the totality of that entire creation. Because if you look at a spiral galaxy from the center around, and it always goes around, it looks like a whirlpool, but if you look at it, it's a nine. <laughs> you understand? It's a nine. So when he was talking about understanding, if you understand the concepts of threes, sixes, and nines, he was understanding, he was telling you that the nature of existence as it is in this moment. That's what he was talking about. No argument again. Uh, so yes, you, uh, there is what is, which is reality, it. And there is what uh, emerges from reality, which is knowledge regarding itself. Because we are not other than reality, we're just an aspect of reality. Knowledge mm -hmm. is an aspect of reality. So basically, uh, no matter how you paint it, no matter what you see, whether you see a three, a six, a nine, or a four and a half, or whatever it is, it's always what is looking at itself through knowledge, consciousness, uh, representation. So what is represents itself uh, through consciousness with a certain degree of clarity. So for example, if we pick a mosquito, through a mosquito, reality sees itself with uh, limited to our knowledge because we don't know how the mosquito thinks. But, you know, based on uh, behavior and conduct and stuff and patterns, it's kind of limited. Uh, uh, reality sees itself with a certain degree of clarity uh, in the case of a mosquito or the leaf of a tree or an electron or a string through the vibration of emptiness or nothingness. So reality sees itself with a certain degree of clarity through any of its parts. The, so the whole sees itself through its aspects with a certain degree of clarity. And if the clarity is so infinite that you can consider the aspect a superconductor of the object itself, the noumenon, reality as a whole, then that's what when you can call, you know, the enlightenment of the insight, you know, the reality sees itself and goes, ah, that's what I am. So that eureka moment, uh, the lion's roar of Buddha when he went, okay, I got this. I got this through the, you know, the meditation, the insight meditation that he did. He understood the Four Noble Truth, the three characteristics, uh, impermanence, uh, stress, and uh, non-being or no self or back the uh, you know uh, uh, what do you call that uh, emptiness in uh, in Chinese uh, sunyata etc cetera, etc cetera. the moment that reality is or the point the the wormhole of consciousness through which reality is able to uh, go from being everything pure existing pure being to a consciousness that is based on its uh, its own uh, physicality because you know you need a brain to think. Reality does not does not know it exists directly. It only knows it exists through its aspectual uh, quality, which is phenomena. Whether they are physical, we call physical, mental, spiritual, uh, energy, or whatever it is. So we are the tool. You can. Mike, Jairo, myself, the mosquito, and you know, anything phenomenal is potentially the tool through which reality is able to see itself fully. So this over here, this uh, this uh, representation of three sixes and nines, whether we're looking at a galaxy, we're looking at a string, or we're, we're thinking about uh, ethics, aesthetics, or, you know, uh, the uh, inequalities of the world, whatever it is. Uh, is reality looking at itself trying not even trying because it doesn't know it's trying <laughs> it's, it's the the moment that a mind that a consciousness goes oh this is reality thinking about itself that's when this uh, mistaken identity disappears and reality starts looking at itself with a high degree of uh, precision and clarity hmm. that's interesting i you know i'm i'm for some reason, anytime we're talking about this subject, I think of my, uh, I was married for over 20 years and uh, divorced and, and uh, 
part of uh, my issue was um, I considered weeds that grew out of you know the ground, and I, I, I considered them plants. And so I didn't poison them, and I would let them grow incredibly. This would disturb my appetite very much. It was not a good thing to do. But I, I, I think I did it. I think I also did it as a, <laughs> probably, uh, <laughs> anyway. But some of these weeds would grow so tall that they would flower. And this idea that you're talking about, Lewis, <clears throat> this idea of reality and cognition. And we were talking about the, uh, uh, the cognition revolution, this idea of I am me, oh, I am self, right. this understanding that takes place. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal trip right. to, be, to be here. And uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's art, it's, uh, it's a drama, um, it's, uh, it's a fantastic song. We were just talking about Pink Floyd and, and this idea of the dance. You know, uh, Ken, you talked about the, the galaxy and the spiral and, and the nine. What a wonderful, beautiful dance that is that, that we're doing all at once. Um, mm -hmm. In this reality and the others that have existed before and the ones that are coming up. So it's, it's all happening now at the same time. So this dance is something we've done before. The only thing that changes is our memories of it. That's it. Nothing more. This is why people like you, when you really look at somebody who understands these concepts, they don't worry about anything. They don't even worry about food on the table. They don't worry about Bill. When I was in India, there was some who didn't even wear clothes. They wanted no attachments. They just came out only because they had to, to eat and beg for food and go back into the caves and meditate. That's it. That's all they did. And, mm. and I was like, you know, whoa, you know, I, and, I, and I've seen these guys, they come out with these beads to cover themselves up. Obviously, they come out, they do their begging and right back up into the hills, into the caves, and nobody sees them for 23 hours. <laughs> and, they, they, and, they, cool. and then they come out and, you know, if you, uh, if they're drawn to you or if you're, and, and if you give them a, like a little food, they will give you their teachings, the benefit of their knowledge. Mm. And, yeah, and, you know, and, and I, I, I don't know, it's like the same thing happened to me when I was in Japan. Uh, I don't know if it's because I had so much to, I was, you know, I was in the Marines, I was, you know, 21. So my sobriety was non-existent for those 365 days, that, to say the least. And sure. um, I remember having a, a conversation with this elder Japanese gentlemen that would was always in this park they always outside of these bases that we were at that we had in japan they had these what they call friendship parks just little pocket parks that they would just put up there and one thing i noticed is that these hobos these homeless people would move into these parks and they would take care of them you know the bathrooms were spotless you could go in there and eat food off the off the floor in these baths these are public restrooms and they are spotless they clean the parks. If there's any trouble, they, they make sure, you know, they act like police. They don't do anything. And <laughs> I would always go staggering up the hill because that, my base that I was at was on top of a hill that I would be so drunk that I'd have to kind of take up five minutes and sit there and catch my breath before I'm back up the hill. Well, there was this, always this group and there was always this man I made eye contact with for like six, seven months. And the moment before I left, we finally kind of started talking. And... It turns out that him and his whole group, this was back in the 80s, were World War II veterans and they were samurai. Mm. And they were so, so disgruntled with, the, 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 with Japan surrendering and adopting Western ways that they broke their swords and turned their back on society. Mm. And, and it, was, it, was, it, was the, it struck me, it was so deep how these guys were. They were so into the whole Bushido code. They, they really understood what it was. And they were like, it was better that they dropped 20 nukes than we lose our ways in who we are, which is why mm. they, they did what they did. You know, they, they dropped, I mean, they, they, that's, that, that's when they turned their back, the symbolic meaning of that is them breaking their swords and turning, and that's exactly wow. what they did. And the knowledge that they had, you know, what they were talking about, what they knew, you know, was all the old world, Esoteric, yes. to me, it made no sense at the time. But now, as I reflect back on the conversations I had with them, you know, and, you know, I mean, it was yeah. like, 
he was, he was the one that made me aware of the whole racial problem. And, you know, in, 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 I had, I had rose colored glasses. They're like, you're dark skin. What are you doing in that country? This is what they do. He knew more of American history than I did. This is beyond uh, the sort of this Western uh, um, pestilence that you describe that takes over a, a, uh, a culture. I've heard exactly. it described as well that, uh, for example, Watts, Alan Watts had a lecture on Japanese uh, carpentry. And uh, to be a Japanese uh, carpenter, this is an ancient uh, uh, skill. And uh, the way you described it, you'll have to, much better than I could, but essentially, it's you need to start learning when you're five or six. Well, that yep. society has changed so much that, you know, you go to school until you're 20 to be an insurance salesman, as the way Watts put it. And it's too late because you needed to be with your father from the time you were five or six that whole time. Yeah. And the whole thing's lost. A very interesting yeah. story. Yep. That, what an I've never forgotten them. I've never what forgotten that man. I never even asked his name. I don't know his name to this day. To this day. It was like one of those surreal moments, those aha moments. I had an aha moment before I had, I realized I had an aha moment, you know? But again, like I said, you know, the alcohol was on the brain, that kind of thing, you know? So I was like, really, I, was, I really wasn't about it. But the, the, the funny thing is, it was like a lucid dream. I remember every word of the conversations that we had, you know? Mm. And it was just, you know, to the, I wonder, you know, I wonder what became of them. I, these guys, they were all very, very stoic. Very, when I, when, they, when they, they, they told me they were Japanese, I mean, I could see it then. They sat there cross-legged like in, like in Lotus, backs straight, you know, very lucid, very, very, you know, very, they, and they just watched life go by. That's it. That's all they did. That's all they did. Kind of like those men in India in the caves, just their own way of, uh, like I said, perceiving the reality through their perspective. Amazing. Yeah. Ken, um, you said before you teach. Excuse are, me. Are you, are you said before that you teach. Are you a teacher? I, I teach uh, high school, but I'm working with ESC kids right now. SC. And, uh, yeah. Um, um, special, special education. School. Yeah, special Spe ed. Special needs. Okay. 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 Special needs. Special needs kid. I teach at the high school level now, but now that's kind of gone and out of the way too. So it's like, eh, you know. I also do have my own spiritual discourses class that I do on my, I have like a little Facebook page, that kind of thing, you know? Yes. So I just, yes. I do, I, I give my satsans once a week, that kind of thing. So you guys are more than welcome to come in if you guys want to. If you're on Facebook, you can join the school. May I say the school, Hiro? Yes. <laughs> you yeah. got an invite and you never accepted it. <laughs> it's, called, it's called the School of Inner Awareness and Meditation, or so I am. Interesting. I'll, I'll look. I'll look at that. I look at that. Um, <laughs> so we, we're talking. We we are all looking at, or we all have interest in this kind of uh, non-conventional thinking, uh, which you're still thinking, but it's non-conventional. Where we, instead of looking at things and the relationships between uh, between things, uh, uh, we look at through things and through their relationships, we look at the nature or the essence of anything in any relationship, any group or anything. So uh, that is a perspective that is different. It's still a perspective, but it's different. <clears throat> and it's a combination of those two different ways of looking at things, which is a conventional one. We're still talking about things and their relationships, and we're still talking about their essence. The only difference is that things in their aspect have a specific aspect, but the essence of anything I propose is the same one. All things are the same in, in essence. Now, th that essence is the, the quid. What is the essence of anything? What is the nature of any phenomenon? The and soul. Even the nature, I'm sorry? The soul. Uh, yeah, you can call that the soul, but uh, of course that brings a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, I'm very careful when I talk, especially about abstract things or subtle things or things that are, you know, you can't touch or, or see like non-being, uh, uh, non-arising. <laughs> uh, 
I'm very careful to define the word or the perspective from which I, I, I use the word. So soul, mm -hmm. if you talk about soul, a lot of people are going to think is me, uh, the non the non material me, but it's still me. Uh, and you know, or that some people talk about our individual soul, and then there's the universal soul, Brahman. So you, you start talking about wait, wait a minute. I mean, well, they're one and the same. The universal soul and the individual, the, the perceived individual yes. are the same. Uh, yes, no they, they have different aspects. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So again, uh, this is this is the the conversation. This is our interest. We're trying to define the soul, right? The individual soul, the 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 uh, universal soul, the, uh, the the cosmic soul. What is that soul? What is it? What? Is, how do you define that? Because that energy, soul, energy, pure energy. Uh, yes, yes, uh, is. So yes, you can you can talk about that too and say okay, well this is pure energy. The whole the whole reality is pure energy. Exactly. Um, but but uh, what is the nature? What is the soul of energy? What is the essence? What how do I describe in very gen general words uh, what is and how? What are the qualities of energy? For example, um, you can also how do I describe the indescribable? Because you know, exactly. if the essence of it, you know, it's it's how do you describe the ineffable, the undescribable, and it, you can it, it only. Can be, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I, you can only describe it by uh, opposition. What it is not <laughs> that I can touch and feel and, and measure. So, what is the quality? What is the 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 very uh, description of not? Because everything is if not. If it's everything, if it's everything, like you said earlier, if it's really everything and understanding itself in different aspects, then the real question is, what it, isn't it? So if That's it's right. everything, if it's everything, then the, the question is null and void. Because it it's is. everything. It's in one it aspect of that. Now, in it's understanding it, it cannot be understood. Like I always talk about um, people uh, uh, trying to understand through the perspective of the mind and science, remember. The mind is a, a, a three-dimensional object, I guess, if you want to call it for lack of a better term. And what we're talking about are fourth, fifth, and sixth dimensional concepts. So in order to, to, to take a three-dimensional mind and try to understand a higher level concept requires a certain type of uh, understanding, okay? Now, let me be clear on this. The... I liken this to having a 3G phone and trying to jump onto a 5G network. It just can't be. There has to be a bridge between the two. Therefore, to understand what it is that you're talking about cannot be quantified, cannot be spoken of, cannot be compartmentalized by a three-dimensional mind. It can be understood through direct experience of what it is that you're talking about, which is what um, would happen to me when I went to India, when I had my third eye open, you know, and everything became a question like what happened to Buddha. What Buddha understood when he had his aha moment was that everything he did, everything that he tried to understand was completely worthless. He didn't have to. When he was asked what enlightenment was, he just looked at the guy and he said, I'm awake, nothing more, nothing more. All the other concepts and everything else was, you know, completely irrelevant, irrelevant to him. They were all different, you know, it's like trying to understand a tree one leaf at a time. You see, or trying to chop down a tree one branch at a time instead of the trunk. I like to use these kind of examples. It kind of simplifies them. It kind of makes it a little bit more. Good. Sometimes it's a little too simple, but, you know, for a lot of people definitely, definitely can get for them to see what it is that I'm, that I'm trying to convey. So the direct experience, attaining that direct experience is key to understanding what it is that you're talking about, what it is that you're trying to understand. So for me, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it. I'm not saying that, you know, to me, whatever resonates with an individual person, if that resonates true to their heart with them, whatever it is that they're pursuing is what they're supposed to be doing. I don't judge it. I don't condemn it. I do not say it's wrong. I say more power to you. Knock yourself out. 
because there's something along that path that you need to learn in order to learn that, well, maybe I need to switch gears, need to jump onto another path. But one thing I've understood is that the truth that we're looking for is all around us. Therefore, it is pathless. So to truly understand what is pathless, to compartmentalize yourself to a path is only going to take you further from truth. That's what uh, Luis Del Pino uh, refers to as consilient. To, yeah, that's uh, Krishnamurti too. Yeah. To Krishnamurti. Uh, bring in the different sciences, the different humanities. Uh, yeah, trying to get out of, of your own uh, science and, and try to focus on, on the object of uh, focus. <laughs> Yeah, or whatever, and but uh, uh, use different uh, different fields to understand it better. Modalities it, to be mean. less dogmatic, to have an open mind, and and see what uh, other specialists how they view it, and not not think of it all. To, no, there must be only one theory that that should handle it. No, you should uh, use all theories and and see That's that. True. Yeah, it's like a, a big elephant, and and we're all. Uh, the six blind men, and we're touching yeah. different parts of the elephant, and we're saying, "Oh, this, this tail. Oh, this is the rope." This, and but you see, what, what, it is. What, what I've learned is that for some people, what you were just saying, they have that dogmatic view. And you know what? What I've learned is that although that does not resonate with me, it is okay for them. So more power to them if they want to approach it with a ritualistic, dogmatic approach, as narrow as that is then that's where they're supposed to be. I just don't judge it anymore. It just is what it is. Go for it. If that's what you need to do, then that's what you need to do. If that's how you understand the world around you, that's how they, they I always used to friend, I have this friend that I grew up with. You know, he always, a smart kid, and we're the same age, started kindergarten and everything. We stayed friends all these years. He's always would get these killer jobs and he would always do well for himself, but he would always blow it because he struggled with addiction. And uh, all these years, you know, I kept, you know, he, he over the years, it's always been this way. Well, about six or seven years ago, he found Jesus and completely turned his life around. You know, he belongs to a, a, a very, to us would be a very narrow, dogmatic, ritualistic type of thing. But you know what? It works for him. And that's fine. And that's fine. People got to come into it on their own, which is why the old teachings always stress Work on your light. Make your light shine brighter. Because when the right. darkness comes on those around you, they instinctively look for light. There's not a lot of time. You got to get what you can get. I mean, you know, I mean, in terms of this this ride that we're on, I, I agree. I heard the Dalai Lama say that. He's like, look, if this is what you were raised in and, and this speaks to you, then continue down that path. Exactly. You know, there's not a lot of, uh, this is, uh, I got sober in uh, 2002, uh, September 5th, that's my sobriety day. And um, this idea of the steps, this idea of an awakening, there's not a lot of time here. This is a, this is a short ride now, uh, at least while I'm here, you know, while I'm enjoying this. So that's really my perspective as well. I mean, if, if, uh, if you can, uh, you know, wherever you're at right now, just, uh, you know, open up, open up your eyes. And so, what is your name again? Mike. My twin? I'll call you my twin. <laughs> <laughs> my brother from another mother. All right. Question. When you say, you know, I have a short time, you know, we only have like a short time here. When you say I, who are you talking about? Mike. Mike. This experience, this ride. Okay. But the soul is infinite, correct? It's true. I get that. But, uh, you know, there's this, this idea, and you talk about energy, this idea mm -hmm. of being able to absorb it. I still have that, that, that idea of that thirst or that craving, which we could talk a little bit about, but that, uh, uh, that sense of adventure, that energy that's driving me to be able to pull it in. You know, there's that aspect of nature, that wildness. Um, so that's what that's that's what I'm talking about. So, okay. so when you talk when you talk about excuse me, I heard my name. Ken, 
I was gonna, yeah. I was, I was gonna uh, kind of uh, go on to your question. You know, when you talk about I, who, is, who am I, and and, yeah. and the soul, the soul is infinite and eternal, but the soul does not know in and of itself or in and of by itself. It doesn't know. It only knows through I, Mike, I, Ken, I, Lewis, I, Mosquito, I, et cetera, et cetera, with a certain degree of knowledge. So the soul, as a pure being, does not know. We are the, we are the, and, and this is my view, that we are the instrument, the tool through which the soul knows itself. And each, each knowledge is different because each, each uh, uh, mind is born in a different place, has a different body, has different uh, you know, aspects, different history, different everything. But you see where I'm going with this. So when I say I, I don't have a lot of time. What Mike is saying is that the aspect of the soul, which is eternal, uh, 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 aspectualized in Mike, has a, a determined time. See, mm -hmm. so life mm -hmm. looks at itself through holes, you know, and those holes are consciousness or aspects of itself, mm -hmm. uh, which can be a, con uh, a human consciousness or it can be uh, the, the doorbell on, on your door. Yep. That's a very, it's really good if that's, you know, if, if, again, if that's how, what works for you, that's fine. You see, my, my take on what you're saying, though, it's the opposite. It's the soul that has all the knowledge. The soul knows what it is. It's the mind that doesn't. So when you call yourself I and call yourself I as part of the body and relate to yourself in the body that you are, of course, you're not going to know because you're coming from the perspective of mind. Uh, very good. Um, uh, the, the soul knows everything or is everything potentially. So the, 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 infinite knowledge is potential but it is actualized not in infinitely it is actualized with a certain degree which is a curve from zero not knowing nothing to infinity so the soul being everything and nothing at the same time potentially has infinite knowledge and of course infinite time and space it's everything but because it is potential, it cannot know it, but through is actualized self. I recommend reading the book by uh, David Bohm, a 1980s, 1970s physicist that, that uh, spoke about uh, uh, the uh, actualized reality and non-actualized reality, but it's the same thing. And he speaks of reality as a... Um, uh, hologram mm -hmm. where like. the, when you go small, 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 the whole of reality is potentially in that like, tiny little thing. For example, in my case, in this body, in this mind, in this envelope of, of phenomena, you know, uh, atoms and, and stuff, uh, the whole of reality is potentially in there. So if you cut me up in the a trillion little pieces and you take the tiniest piece of myself which is a quantum you know of energy the whole of the energy uh, the whole of reality is there potentially not actualized that's why in physics when they go small 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 and they go into the string they find out in their formulas that the energy of space the empty space of nothing of zero kelvin is infinite that, mm -hmm. That's the, the soul that you're talking about is right there, mm -hmm. potentially, potentially not actualized. That's why the soul in my... How does it actualize? Uh, because uh, of the nature of reality is, quant uh, is uh, uh, quantum. That means that zero, zero Kelvin only exists for a span of time of 10 to the minus 35 Mm -hmm. in a space of 10 to the minus 35, which is the mm -hmm. Planck scale, where when you cut reality into the tiniest, tiniest, tiniest piece, uh, you see the quantum, which is zero, becoming something or a quantum, 
with a frequency and an energy that is indescribable to us. So reality and then it has a massive expansion, correct? A massive expansion. It, it could it could have with a certain with a certain mm -hmm. probability the zero can expand. That's the inflationary cosmology you, you, you're mentioning there. That zero, which has a very tiny energy, the quantum energy, the, the, the energy of a quantum, expands, and with it, each energy of the quantum zero becomes you know bigger and bigger and bigger, and can uh, or does, I, I believe, at infinity and in eternity, become a bubble. A so bubble it sounds like you're describing. It sounds like you're describing the Big Bang. Or the Big Bang theory. and the Big, the Big, or, yes, the Big Bang being crushed. Theory. Yeah, yeah. Because in the Big Bang, the problem is that they, they don't have time before time. They, they say, okay, it's zero, then nothing. But in my view, because reality must be everything and nothing, so it is eternal and infinite at the same time. There cannot be a no time. So every mm -hmm. time zero, every time uh, zero Kelvin becomes a quantum and that's a world right there mm -hmm. in and of itself now how big or small it doesn't matter because it's already there potentially the the soul of the universe is now remember in eternal zero the definition of zero is of having no meaning but still holding a place you see to me zero so, is infinite <laughs> yeah i mean uh, zero is the aspectual uh, one uh, in the in the scope of reality, zero is just one aspect, and infi infinite is another aspect. So to me, zero and one are the same. That's the quantum nature of things. Zero is one. One is zero. Form mm -hmm. is emptiness. Emptiness is form. I mean, the, the, in the Heart Sutra, that's the first thing. The first verse of the Heart Sutra is that Absolutely. form is emptiness. Emptiness is form. And in that dipole. Zero one is the whole of, of uh, the, the soul, the reality, uh, and and then you can kind of conceptualize what is one is one two three four five. Da, 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 da. So the world that we see in its uh, in its amplitude, in its incredible you know fifteen billion years worth of stars and galaxies, and you know, us in there in the middle looking looking at it, is one. And, mm -hmm. I mean, one can be very big, 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 or very tiny, tiny. It can be a quantum. It can be a zero. So to me, the soul that you talk about, Paraman, is also Atman, is everything and nothing at the same time. But I insist, and this is my view, we can disagree on that, that the whole does not know itself uh, fully uh, and only knows itself with a certain degree of uh, clarity which means that uh, it knows itself just a little bit at the quantum level, you know, the string, which is a quantum of zero, uh, the zero uh, uh, energizing itself into one uh, with a very, very tiny time and span, uh, lifetime and everything. It's almost virtual. They call it virtual particles. Uh, that is reality looking at itself with very little knowledge. And then you, you can put a lot of ones together and then you, you make the galaxy and then within the galaxy you have a planet and then within a planet you have something that becomes a brain and then from the brain from the complexity of that uh, machine uh, the, the self-awareness self-awareness uh, 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 you know happens and then that self-awareness also is in a gradient of how, you know am i a mosquito am i a, a primate i have a, am i an individual uh, a human and then with each uh, uh, human consciousness, you have this kind of a transcendence, a, a, a thinking that leaves itself. In the uh, Kula Sunyata Sutra of the Buddha, which is the, the Sutra on emptiness, he describes the different levels of knowledge within the human mind. That's the most complex uh, com uh, con consciousness that we know of. And he goes from the you know levels of meditations, the seven jhanas, the concentration, and everything. And then in the last one, the mind looks at itself and goes, "Ah, I am impermanent. I am stressful, and I am nothing." And uh, th that knowledge frees itself from itself, and that's where reality is able to, like a superconductor, look at itself and go, "Here, here I am. I am that." That uh, sound, I think the the the, mm -hmm. the thing is. 
So basically, reality, when it leaves the mind behind, it, it, the same, the same uh, analogy of the, the boat going from one shore to the other is still the same thing. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. It's just that reality cannot leave itself because there's nowhere to go because reality is everything and nothing. So it doesn't matter. It's the lamp, the lava lamp, the yellow thing mm-hmm. does not leave. It's there. It, it, it disappears, appears, disappears, appears. So that's reality looking at itself. And when it sees itself as such through a uh, consciousness, an enlightened consciousness, a Buddha, a Buddha mind, it just gets in and goes, okay, I sit, I sit at ease looking at myself. I don't suffer anymore because before that there was a lot of noise in the lens. But, you know, as, as the, the consciousness becomes clearer and clearer, becomes more transcendent, 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 sees through itself through its phenomenal aspects then the soul sees itself clearly uh, beyond its uh, its own thinking apparatus which is atman the human consciousness mm-hmm. and that's when it's it uh, just sits down and goes ah huh, that's me i i just saw myself mm-hmm. fully uh, through this enlightened mind so mm-hmm. it's a it's a coming together a, a, a wholeness of the whole looking at the whole through its parts and that um, coming together which and I, i'm totally agreement i don't disagree with anything you say trust me i don't like i said i don't disagree with what anybody believes or thinks and how they want to pursue it i'm no problem with it I, but, yeah. but, but what i'm saying is that consciousness that you get when you have that understanding is understanding what the soul has always known Potentially. So, so, <laughs> you, but, but you, you actualize is, the potential. You actualize the potential knowledge, that infinite knowledge, which is transcendent. It has to be uh, that when we talk about omniscience, it's not about knowing all the things. You cannot know all the things because, you know, each consciousness is in a place. So unless you use consilience and use all the accumulated science of all the years of your, you know, and, and you go deep into each science and you create everything, you still have to go through knowledge you know what i mean the knowledge that goes through the knowledge for reality to actualize its own potential Mm -hmm. which is indescribable if if the vehicle that you're using to attain that is the mind yes that's exactly what you have to go yes you can bypass all of that by merging with the soul because what you're getting to when you got to that seventh level when you said oh now i really understand it that's emergence with the soul. That's getting yes. to understand what the soul has always known. Well, the soul merging with itself because it, there's no separation. There's only one soul. So, right. so like I'm saying, like the I mind is of the soul. Pink Floyd, when I gave the analogy of Pink Floyd, instead of focusing on the aspects, which was everything that you described, focus on the one. That's right. The aspects right. take care of themselves. So you don't have to but, worry about attaining this, attaining that by understanding the atmas you were talking about by going in and having the direct experience of the atma everything that you've just described answers itself yes so how how long is the the trip the trek between one shore to the other is up to each point now mm-hmm. some people take a lifetime to get there it took me you know i didn't think in these terms until i became about 38 or 40 and it took me a long time to go, ah, okay, you know, to, to build this kind of a verbalization within my mind where it goes like, okay, this is reality thinking about itself. It took me 20 years. I don't know, maybe some people take 10, some people take five. They, they say that a mind can enlighten, you know, from birth. Based on my own experience, based on my own experience, I don't think it's very probable. Is it possible? Yes. But uh, what is more probable that what is more probable is that a mind through a lot of thinking, a lot of uh, pondering, a lot of hypothesizing, a lot of consilience of different knowledge from different people arrives to this conclusion. I have never seen, let's put it this way, a mind that was not very complex, abstract, educated, uh, super perspective. I can't hear. Uh, oh. Did you mute me? Uh... No, you're, I hear you. Okay, so it's, it's, uh, it's Ken who can't hear right now. Ken, you must have uh, uh, done something to your phone. 
Hello? Can you hear me? We, yes. yes. If you can hear me, nod your head. Okay, I can't yes, hear can. you. Well, something and My phone is your, acting up. Your, I can't, I can't ad, hear what you're saying. Your admin became uh, uh, deaf. Can I believe, I believe it's the connectivity in the room that you're in? Because Who is that? Frame rate <laughs> dropped when That's Rami. I, I didn't know Rami was with us. Yes, Rami, welcome, Rami. Welcome, welcome, Rami. <laughs> Are you here? Uh, from, from about 10 minutes or 15 minutes before uh, uh, Mike McKenna left. It's, uh, oh, Mike McKenna is gone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I missed something in the middle. Five minutes. Don't worry about your awareness features. <laughs> As you can see, I don't know everything, although I do believe that I know the nature of anything. <laughs> anyway, so, um, uh, well, I, I am all out of fresh ideas here. As a matter of fact, I think Hello? I need to... Yes? Hello? Yes. Oh, okay, I'm back. Yeah, I lost, I, lost, I, I lost audio. I'm sorry. I didn't, I kind of missed that whole last part. Gotcha. Well, I don't know. I don't know where you where you lost uh, your audio, but I think we we both agree on the concept that uh, uh, the soul Maybe. is the infinite knowledge of its of uh, everything uh, by everything, and and uh, the human knowledge, the human enlightenment, is a function to infinity of that uh, uh, actualization of the potential infinite knowledge of the whole regarding both, itself both ken and luis uh are are con concilianting towards uh the same object they, yeah we're trying to they, describe they come from different uh, uh fields of study but it it sounds to me like they're pointing to the same moon yeah yeah the same <laughs> yeah, reality uh we we yeah, are cool. trying to express uh conventionally uh, the transcendental so basically, we're trying to ex express the soul, the, you know, this concept of soul, which is infinite knowledge of everything uh, by itself, uh, you know, uh, regarding itself in a uh, more trivial, more uh, conventional way, which is the human language. Yeah, how exactly. Do you, yeah. How do you Six talk dimensional about concept to a three yeah, dimensional so. mind. How do you describe the infinite through finite uh, descriptions or, or words? But you can get very, very close to it. Uh, and, and of course, you have to kind of uh, be very super perspective, very open minded, very uh, almost very um, uh, this, this, uh, disassembled in your mind in order to uh, be able as a mind to understand infinity and eternity right there. Uh, in one in one uh, swoop, I always say that this this kind of feeling is uh, going through a wormhole where uh, the actualize deactualizes itself and goes through the the uh, the, uh, the uh, there's a word for that uh, that uh, donut and uh, you kind of uh, from one side which is actualized you know the phenomenal world you deconstruct it uh, yourself in the world you go through the middle and you fizzle out you disappear you become a 100 percent potential zero actualization in a sense you become like the zero kelling and boop, you pop on the other side quantumized and then you become you know uh, the whole of uh, reality which then as you reactualize uh, become a, a human consciousness in the real world in the phenomenal world you just described a black hole <laughs> uh, yes a black hole is uh, as a white hole there's no doubt about it uh, so basically it is possible and you know in physics terms we could consider uh, the soul as a black hole that has all the information infinite information that pops that pops it has so much density that the space-time uh, uh, is broken so uh, space-time is broken and boom you you have a white a white hole which is what we describe as uh, the uh, the big bang or, yeah, exactly or, or sub big bang or tiny big bang. I, I saw i saw a note there by uh, rami saying no i disagree it, it just doesn't uh, like that uh, concept oh is there a chance it must be. I saw. I saw. I know. I disagree, there. Rami. 
<laughs> Mommy disagrees. All right. Let's hear it. Actually, they, there are seven notes. Wait a minute. <laughs> I missed that. Oh. How do we get to the notes? I'm new to this. Oh, there's uh, a there's a button that the, somewhere. Well, it might be different on a phone, but uh, but on the desktop, there's a there's a little uh, a thing for chat, and it it throws a panel to the right, and you can see what okay. I'm writing. Okay, I'm seeing it now. Okay, so Mike disappeared. Yeah, I see that. Uh, I was actually okay, taking a I leak. Okay, I see seven. A very quiet leak. I disappeared to go take a leak uh, because I drank too much coffee this morning, and in the meantime, Mike disappeared, and and uh, Ronnie. <laughs> joined in so I missed half the picture so Rami you disagree oh, I I what's what, what's the what's the deal you disagree with the, this description well the soul is inherited All right there's so, no wall rather it is something which was imbued into the first human Ever and whomever the first humans were, and what we have is the inheritance of that one human soul. Uh, do, do mosquitoes have a soul? Do they inherit a soul too? Uh, if they do, then it would be their mosquito soul. Now, whether okay. the human soul, remember, we're only using words here to differentiate between the human soul and the mosquito soul. We can, yeah. we can say single cell organisms soul, and we can say that we all inherit that, that life, that force, that breath, that So, if, if that, I, if, if the beginning of, of Rami. Thing. Rami, if I describe, if I change the, the word soul to self-awareness, and I did a, a function from zero to infinity, would that, uh, would that uh, also describe what you're saying? That we, every aspect of reality is endowed with some self-awareness that goes from zero in a rock, for example, to uh, infinity in an enlightened uh, uh, consciousness, human consciousness, for example? I think it's unproven that awareness is, is something which exists in action. Awareness could be the effect of certain biological processes. So we so, like to think that we're aware. We, we act as though we're aware. We speak of awareness as it is an objective uh, How can I get my beard like Ken? But even our consciousness <laughs> themselves may be a reflection of something that is, so at its core, something biological. Well, you could, yes, you could, you could say it's biological, but uh, uh, you know, I, I like to kind of uh, de-anthropomorphize uh, uh, self-awareness and just look at uh, something that, like an instrument through which what is, which is reality as a whole, is able to be aware of itself with a certain degree of clarity. That way I could, I could feasibly hypothesize that a string, which is the vibration uh, of nothingness, the, the first vibration of nothingness, of the empty space, uh, could have a very tiny self-awareness. That means that reality could possibly see itself a little bit through a string, a little bit more through an atom, a little bit more through a molecule, a little bit more through a bucket of water, a little bit more through a leaf, a little bit more through a tree, a little bit more through a mosquito, and then a little bit more and more and more through a human human mind, which is the the, the more self-aware thing that we know of. I, I have no problem with that. Okay. Right um, whether it's the result of a biological process or whether it's a, a conceptual but also on the other end of things, speak of infinity. Well, there are multiple infinities, and I don't think we've even reached the end of the first one. So when we think about ourselves as being potentially infinite or expressions of the infinite. I, I, I'm very quickly reminded that we have a beginning, we have an end, 
I don't know that the universe will exist beyond the space time, but but it seems that it would. Though our form of consciousness of the universe may be superseded or extinguished. Oh, that's that's for sure. Uh, human self awareness uh, arises with uh, uh, the fetus and uh, finishes with uh, the death of that body. But the universal consciousness, which is unaware of itself, if it's not through a, one of these uh, temporary consciousnesses, uh, is infinite and eternal. I, I propose that reality, whether uh, there is something or there is nothing, is still reality. So, uh, a reality cannot but not exist. <laughs> It, it, uh, or, but exist. There's something very. Um, uh, what What is the native religion to Japan? Um, Shin, Shinto? Shinto. Shinto. There's something very poetically Shinto about uh, about some of your uh, your words. Uh -huh. Well, so, Shinto ultimately goes back to India. Yeah. To me, that to be clear, I I posit or I hypothesize that reality has no beginning and no end because reality exhibits two qualities or two aspects, which is being uh, anything different from zero and non-being, which is zero. So it is, when I talk about reality, I'm not talking about things. Uh, things are only aspects of uh, reality. When I talk about reality, I talk about both uh, things and no thing. Uh, that being zero Kelvin, so and that's so whether whether there is something aspectualized or not, reality is. So that's uh, to me, it, it takes away the beginning and the end. Uh, is there going to be a reality when all the galaxies disappear? And because when all the galaxies disappear, it's nothing but a big zero. I'll say, yeah, the reality will be there. It will be a big zero. Okay. Where where are your explorations in non duality? There, uh, the non duality is only a, uh, a aspectual consideration of what is. So there is one reality. <laughs> to me, uh, non duality is, is saying that there's only one reality, uh, no matter what it looks like, wherever you put your finger or your eye on or your ideas, uh, there is reality. Reality is everywhere nowhere uh, at the same time and at no time. So basically, there is, the only duality is precisely <clears throat> the aspectualization of the otherwise non-aspectual reality. The soul that uh, Ken was talking about, uh, without any uh, actualization, uh, but uh, one thing that, and this is, this was the Eureka moment for me, guys. The Eureka moment for this consciousness was the moment that I realized that uh, Nibbana, not being, or, you know, the cessation of anything, and Samsara uh, were two aspects of the same one thing. And of course, it looks really, really different. It appears very different. Zero appears very different from one whatever that one looks like. But in reality, in reality is both zero and one at the same time, concurrently, forever, wherever. That's, that's the way I describe the whole of reality. And of course, that's a non-dual approach. Although I see duality in the aspect between zero and one, I do not see reality in the essence of reality, which, uh, 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 zero and one are inherited from reality, the being, pure being. So I have a both uh, a non-dual and dual approach to reality, but at the end of the day, I only see one reality, whether I see anything in it or not. And when you say it, what are you looking at? Everything and nothing at the same time. <laughs> so it is tat, uh, you know, the, 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 the data. Tat tuam asi? Yeah, you, that's right. So tat, which is it, is zero, one, infinity, or anything between. It is that. Is everything, nothing, everywhere, and nowhere at the same time 
I have no time, every time. You know what you just described? It. You know what that it is? Uh, it's everything and nothing at the same time. You just described the soul. Yes, 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 yes. So yeah. by, I mean, you, I can you give have a name, soul by but, going in and yeah. merging with that soul. I, I don't like, like calling it before. soul because people misunderstand. But it is a kind of, a, what, is, what is it? Well, it is it and it's everything and nothing. So I'd rather not use soul, spirit, uh, uh, the universal consciousness or nothing because it is much easier to talk about, although it is much more difficult to describe. But uh, I don't like to use the word soul, uh, although I understand exactly what you're talking about. When you, when you say soul, I say it. And to okay, me, so the there are no that connotations. That you're talking about, that it that you're talking about is within your body, correct? It All is living every, things have... You see, Rami used a, a, a verb, a, a word that was very interesting. Uh, we inherit it. That means that it is in everything. And uh, I, I, I mentioned uh, uh, Baum again, who says that uh, reality is a hologram. No matter how small you cut it, there is the whole of reality in it. The smaller it is, the more potential, the more energy. Is. Everything is in it. It's a non-actualized reality. So I like the, I like the, the word hologram in, in the sense uh, actualization versus uh, potential. Uh, but what you call soul, uh, and, and Rami says that we inherit it, that is telling me that you both are talking about the same thing, which is uh, reality is in everything because reality uh, is aspectualized in a, in a, in a uh, ratio, in a certain ratio. How much energy, let's put it this way, how much aspect is there in a human being, how much aspect is there in a galaxy, how much aspect is there in a cluster of galaxies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you want, we could say that energy is aspectualization <laughs> of it. And because we can measure aspect, but we cannot measure it. It's immeasurable. Uh, I, I'd like to... Uh... I'd like to reclaim what you just stated in a smaller scale. Uh, everything that our mind can um, witness is an object, but our witnessing of it transforms it to a subject in our mind. Right. Uh, uh, Ken, Ken. Yeah. If you move, yeah. If you're moving around, go ahead and mute your phone because you, you were. Uh, oh, I, I, I muted him. Okay. So go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Rami. So everything the mind can a mind can represent, let's put it this way, of what is. Right. What of what what? Uh, so you so were saying that object, every mind is a representation. Have, we have our subjective understanding of that object. We'd always like to think that that the what we view or what we understand is the objective universe, but but really it's a series of objects that that, that our mind is constructing for us. And in that process, somehow, whether we want to or not, we're always attaching some level or degree of subjectivity to that. So I can speak of this subject. You can speak of that subject. The objective is not necessarily what we're experiencing or what we're explaining. Correct. We're always sort of reaching or grabbing or groping or... Uh, let me, let me, uh, let me pause more. you there. Let me pause you. Don't lose the, 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 the string of thought. But uh, Haido, go ahead and, and share with Rami that uh, uh, little uh, analysis of Boltman's uh, uh, concept of reality. And you will see in it, Rami, exactly what you just said, that uh, uh, the, the mind represents what is. So the mind is always kind of extracting aspects and ideas and things of the whole thing of it. I think that's where you, you were going with this, right? Well, actually, I wanted to explore the idea of territory. Because when, when, you, when you delve into... Okay, I'm just going to watch. Oh, that's right. Boltzmann's concept of reality. Thank you. Uh, I, if, you if you read that, I think it's going to tell you exactly what you are talking about. How the mind represents the whole. 
and how many different ways you can represent it and how you should be very super perspectivist in how you look at things because the whole it is really, really, really eternal and infinite. So how do you describe it? How do you represent it to yourself? By looking at the aspects of it because you don't see the whole thing. You don't see the non-phenomenal side of reality, the non-aspectual side of reality, which is also all, always infinite, an infinite not being, non-being. So uh, what we see of reality, according to science, is about what, 5% of the whole energy of the universe? Because uh, 5% is, uh, you know, uh, atoms and stuff, stuff that we can measure, the phenomenal thing. And that includes our mind, you know, how the visible side is able to, to look at it and measure and, and think about it. And then there's dark energy, uh, dark, uh, dark matter, I'm sorry, which we don't see, but we know it's there because of the gra gravitational pull of nothing. We don't see anything, but we, we feel the gravitational pull. That's uh, the, how galaxies, you know, stay the way they are. And then there's a freaking amount of 75% of dark energy, which I suspect is the non-phenomenal uh, non-aspectual side of reality, which we don't even know what it is, but actually, when you think about it, it makes uh, the, the universe expand. It's like a positive force instead of a negative force. So the yin-yang, the yin-yang that we, uh, you know, the yin-yang represents very well my uh, description of reality. Uh, the yin would be the dark, the non-being, non non-phenomenal, non-aspectual, uh, and the being, the, 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 the yang, uh, or the yin, I don't know which one I called it, is the, the phenomenal side of it. But they're both the same thing. They, they're not different. Uh, they, they look different. They feel different to, to uh, our consciousness, but they are the same thing. And it's infinite too. So that yin yang, we see it as a circle, but the circle has no boundaries. It's everywhere, all the time, et cetera, et cetera. But those two qualities of being and non-being, nibbana samsara, are uh, uh, easily uh, distinguishable by a self-aware mind. I don't know if I derailed your, your train of thought, uh, Rami. It's all right. I'm, I'm also, while, 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 while you're speaking, I'm reading and also uh, contemplating while holding the prior concept. So I'm, I'm using my, my, my four-way neurons here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, this this conversation is very enriching because there are four minds uh, talking about the unspeakable, the undescribable, the ineffable, and I think we are able to reach some consilience, some uh, perspectivism, uh, so we can talk about what is unspeakable and still agree a little bit of what we're looking at, which we don't see, we can't feel it, we can't touch it, we can't measure it. It's like the, uh, Kant was talking about the noumenon uh, and uh, phenomena. Uh, actually, he was talking also about noumena. I, I, and there I disagree because uh, uh, I would lump everything, you know, any non-being, any non-phenomenal, non-describable, non as part of the uh, yin of uh, reality. So I, I cannot imagine uh, being able to cut whatever is not cuttable. So it's just like you you cut. Yes. The, the, the favorite oh. my sentence in this paragraph is after 3.1. It says, uh, a scientific theory can and almost surely will one day be replaced by another. Within, within the realm of this, this aspect, you could write volumes of dramas. Uh, it, it's, it's because with, with an understanding comes a politic, and with a politic, mm -hmm. You have these established territories, and with these territories, you have people willing to fight. <laughs> Which is always a, a conflict is is the um, uh, it's the it's the meat and potatoes of, uh, of of a really good story. So I'm curious to know: Does this, or do you think, do you have a political mind, or is this merely are, are you giving the the I don't even know if I'm, I would be using the correct the, the correct word a vanyana about about your approach. No, no, you yeah, that's a that's a beautiful question, Rami, because um, I I I will summarize this by saying that, that the secret uh, of happiness, the secret to happiness of each individual mind, is deliberate action. 
So this that I uh, talk about, this uh, abstract, uh, subtle, uh, ineffable, uh, zero becoming one, one becoming zero, zero being one, one being zero, uh, the aspectual side of reality, phenomena versus luminon and everything, I always take it down to the uh, uh, phenomenal uh, reality. You and I, how we talk, how we cooperate, how we collaborate, how we uh, build and, and create together. So to me, these conversations that are not taken to the political, uh, uh, I would say the hygienic side of reality, what I eat, how I eat, the exercise I do, how do I get along with you guys, how I pay my bills, how I work, how I live in society, the individual versus the collective. If I don't have this kind of uh, uh, trickle down effect, uh, then it's completely sterile. Uh, so yes, I have a political mind that applies these uh, nonsensical, uh, abstract, uh, ineffable, uh, ramblings about the nature of reality into how do I live my life in the conventional sense, this from the conventional perspective. So I, I'm, I'm very political. I have very strong, um, or at least I have very clear ideas what politics should be. Uh, uh, I, I analyze very, very uh, uh, closely the social contract. Uh, there are th three three thinkers that talk about the social contract. Well, I'm I'm going to be the fourth one. Uh, I I see uh, the very very importance of the social contract. Uh, how the individual uh, uh, connects to the collective and how the collective connects to the individual. And I create a yin yang in there. What are is my what is my responsibility? My civic uh, responsibility as an individual towards the collective that I belong to, that I play in, you know, I, I'm in a game of soccer, I have to play the rule by the rules, but also I'm a thinking uh, player. So I could say, hey, this rule here, it's not right. We should change this rule to make the game better. So I uh, think very, very deeply about my responsibility as an individual within the collective. And I see on the other side, the liability of the collective, the responsibility of the collective towards the individual. How do we marry that? And how do we create a politics, uh, a, 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 a rule of the game where the collective uh, gets better while the individual gets better within the collective? They both you know, grow and uh, become better and happier. So yes, that your question is uh, very important to me because at the end of the day, talking about the quantum nature of reality and uh, uh, defining the soul as a de degree of self-awareness of the aspectual side of reality. Uh, if we don't, uh, if we are not uh, humanly happy and thriving and sharing and growing together, uh, we don't have a culture culture is very important. If we don't understand that we are, uh, you are me, I am you, we need to uh, cooperate, collaborate and, and build an environment that is uh, sustainable and clean and uh, uh, pleasant uh, and, uh, and that helps us thrive and grow and be happier and be enlightened, all of us, and then uh, this is, uh, this is uh, wasting time. I hope I didn't misunderstand your question. We're on target. Okay. I, I believe, I believe, uh, I was telling Ken before, I don't know if you heard uh, my, my, my analogy, but I believe that knowledge has two aspects, just like reality has two aspects, the non-phenomenal non and phenomenal. Uh, knowledge has two aspects, the uh, conventional knowledge, you and I talking about, uh, you know, how we should plant uh, tomatoes and uh, what time of the year, uh, and the non uh, the non conventional one, which is applying these ideas about the nature of reality, uh, the soul, and et cetera, et cetera, uh, and combining those in a concilian way uh, to create uh, a growth uh, and uh, happiness. Sukha instead of dukkha. For, to go from dukkha, which is uh, stress and suffering, to sukha, which is uh, well-being, uh, health, and uh, and uh, growth, and uh, but sustainable growth, not uh, not uh, ignorant growth. 
Uh, and that is, that is the beauty of, uh, at least in my view, uh, of this kind of uh, 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 conversation. And, and that's what I would like to build. Uh, I have a, a website, uh, uh, www.trickledownwisdom.com, where I, I kind of throw, uh, throw at the, the, the reader this combination of uh, conventional and non-conventional uh, wisdom and knowledge. Uh, I talk about a transversal way of thinking, uh, uh, which combines both uh, to, uh, to the betterment of the individual and of humanity as a whole. That's, that, uh, that would be my, my school of thought. It's like, hey, let's build something beautiful uh, at the combination, uh, from the combination of conventional and transcendental knowledge. Mm. Thank you for your time this morning, and thank you for well, listening to Boltzmann. Uh, yeah, I uh, I found him uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I'm always looking for something interesting, and uh, it, now I, I need to detach. I need to go, but uh, I I found this uh, this uh, Zoom uh, session extremely. Let's do it, uh, let's do it again ne next uh, weekend. It's I'm so fourth, glad you. Isn't it? The fourth yeah, of July. I'm, Yes, I'm so glad you recorded this, uh, uh, Heido, because many you, times, uh, many uh, conversations that, that I have podcast. <laughs> uh, that, uh, this okay, I think this everyone. is this is a, a beautiful one to share out there, uh, because we went from zero to infinity, and we ended up in politics, uh, or at least <laughs> yeah. the idea of politics. What do we do with all this beautiful knowledge of the soul? And so next week it will be on the politics of freedom. I am. Uh, if I if I can if I can I think I'm gonna. Uh, if you can copy me or give me the link to it, I'm gonna uh, post it on LinkedIn. Uh, okay. LinkedIn is is one of those where I, I try to. I have uh, quite a few contacts in Europe, uh, in Spain because uh, that's where I come from, and uh, there's a lot of suffering out there now with the pandemic and uh, the economy and a lot of people suffering and trying to find out what the hell is going on. And uh, if you don't mind, I would, I, I would like to share this uh, very long uh, Zoom conversation uh, on LinkedIn. Oh, okay. I could, uh, I, I could turn this conversation into a podcast and I'll send you the link of this episode. Absolutely. And uh, if you don't mind, I would like to put it on trickledownwisdom.com. Mm, also, okay. for whoever may want to know what the, the trickling down of transcendental wisdom to the human level and how it works and this is this this is all this conversation the was trickle about. down wisdom sounds so elitist maybe you need a guru maybe you need a wisdom <laughs> guru to, to to receive it uh you know <laughs> at the end of the day the, the knowledge of reality regarding itself is very subtle it's, it's it just doesn't happen really easy and that's why I think that although uh, enlightenment or auto, auto enlightenment, you know, you know, like instantaneous enlightenment is possible, I find it very improbable because you have to put a lot of things together um, in order for reality to see itself in its, uh, in its splendor, in its infinity and eternity. And that is too abstract for... Uh, uh, at least to to consider that like a feeling of uh, the oceanic feeling and all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have those feelings, but uh, the true the true moment of reality seeing itself perfectly through cognition, logic, uh, science, and, uh, and the feelings that come with it. Because of course, enlightenment is very pleasant. Nirvana or nibbana is uh, very pleasant. Is sukha. But it comes with a lot of uh, intricate, abstract notions that I don't. I don't believe that happen like that uh, very easily uh, at the human consciousness level. That's that's my that's my take on that. Uh, enlightenment takes work. That's what I say. In, in the well, you see, the, what I look at it as enlightenment. You know, e n enlightenment. I look at it more as enlightenment. I n. Enlightenment. Yeah. In other words, what you're what, what you're describing is is as um, being able to uh, not be understood is if you take the, again that approaching it through the aspects instead of the one. 
Of course, it's going to take time. Of course, it's going to be difficult to understand. Of course, it might take lifetime after lifetime after lifetime yeah. to get to a certain level of understanding. Yes. Whereas if you take and focus on the one, which is the Atma, if you focus on the soul and merging with the soul and having the direct experience, everything that you describe becomes answered in one fell swoop. The, the, Atma, yes. the Atma is Luis Del Pino's uh, reality, see, uh, being able to, to use our, our, our tools to see itself. The, the, what I, I agree yeah. with you, uh, Ken, the problem that I see there is that uh, Brahman cannot understand itself but through Atman. And Atman is typically very ignorant. If you look at the uh, Paticca Samupada, you, 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 I'm sure you have read it. The individual, uh, the individual the, Atman? The, yeah, the, the, each individual consciousness has to grow out of something. You, you don't have a baby that comes out uh, like a freaking uh, Einstein or a Boltzmann. It just doesn't happen. There's no... There's no instantaneous uh, conventional knowledge. Uh, and because transcendental knowledge is built upon conventional knowledge, uh, I cannot see uh, the, the going from the bottom of the Maslow's pyramid to the top of it, um, which is uh, self-transcendence uh, or uh, self-unification uh, of reality with itself happening uh, in, a, in an automatic way. It, well, it can if you see the top and the bottom as one. Y yes, yes, it can as, as one. Poten potentially, potentially. So there is. So there is no. There is no gap between the two. If there, you understand, there is no gap. Essentially, there is no gap. You're absolutely right, Ken. But the, the there is no gap. But the no gap has to be uh, somehow put together with a gap. Uh, which is uh, uh, conventional self-awareness, con conventional That's again uh, approaching through the mind. That's again approaching everything through the mind. Well, well, the, the thing is, uh, we can hypothesize that reality could possibly know itself uh, without an instrument, but I don't see it. And, and it, because we don't see it, maybe it's a hypothesis that is possible, but we cannot realize, we're potentialize or actualize uh, and that means that the probability of it is very, very small. Like, there may be a unicorn on the other side of the moon, possibly. But the probability of that is infinitely, infinitely small. So what I say is that uh, in, uh, automatic or instantaneous enlightenment of reality, seeing itself clearly without uh, uh, its other side, because that what you're saying there is that the non-phenomenal side of reality can know itself. And then in, in that sense, we are disagreeing on what knowledge, uh, conventional knowledge is or transcendental knowledge is. Because then you are making a distinction, a separation between not being and being. The non-phenomenal. Only the mind, oh, but see, it's only the mind that makes that distinction. It's not the it, self. What you're talking about is it's only the mind that creates that distinction and that separateness. Yeah. The illusion of separateness. You see, yeah. the thing is, my experience when I was when I was in India, and Hiro knows the Mahatma, Mahatma Fakiranandji, initiated me into what they call the Aparavidya. He opened the third eye, and when I talk about the practical experience of the Atma, that's what I had. And how I understood. How come you didn't have that experience of a third eye before? Huh? Excuse well, me. Say it again. How come you did not have that experience of a third eye? Before, mm -hmm. because my karmas were not ready or resolved in order for me to be able to receive that knowledge. In other words, if I had received that knowledge before, it would have meant nothing. It would have been something oh, like a fad and just uh, taken and gotten away. So what you're saying is that if reality was able to open its own third eye without uh, karma, it would not uh, understand what it was talking about because it would not understand karma. So it would be like, what the hell is this? Well, Here I well, am. One thing I. I the thing was, what I, what I understood is at that moment that the I, what we talked about, remember when I asked you, when you say I, me, who are you talking about? Yeah, I understood it. that the I was not here or not I, this body. I understood right. that the I was that, the soul. That is correct. And no, that is, and no, and, and no understanding was necessary. Because that everything that you were looking for, I understood in that moment, I already had. But if you had not understood before, you would not understand what you were understanding then. So what we are, I think we are, we're going to agree on this, 
is that although possibly reality could know itself directly and go, it is it, and this is it thinking, it takes a non a non knowledge an ignorance in order to understand uh, full understanding. Because you cannot separate understanding and non understanding, because if you do, then you don't know what it is to understand. And, and that's why I believe that there's a certain connection between uh, uh, ignorance and uh, enlightenment, and it cannot be uh, understood separately because it, one doesn't make sense without the other. So again, if reality were able to feel itself directly, but did not understand what it felt like before feeling itself directly, it would not know what it's experiencing. Mm -hmm. So well, see, my experience was when you, uh, addressing exactly what you're saying, it wasn't an understanding that came upon me. It was a being, it, it was an experience. It, 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 it was, it, you know, it, it was, it was a lifting of a veil. Yeah, a and then experience. that understanding was that that understanding was already there. I no longer had to search. But if you, See? at the moment of being a superconductor, where reality sees itself without any veil, any, any, uh, 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 any spots, uh, the, the lens is completely clear. Actually, there's no lens. Reality mm -hmm. is uh, a direct experience. Um, it implies that in order to have this direct experience, it, it has to have the previous experience of not having that direct connection. It cannot separate one from the other. That's what I'm, I'm trying to hypothesize here. Because mm -hmm. in the end, you know, how do we know? Uh, you know, how do we know what it is to feel without feeling? So well, you see, in the I'm, end, there is no end. That's the thing. Of course, of course. There of is course. no end. It goes there's on no and on and, no on and on and on. So, so, so the understanding it, of that, that there is no end, to me, and I'm just talking about my own personal experience, to me, that's all I need. I don't need to try to understand this. I don't need to try I, to quantify that. I don't I need to try to explain this because I understand that it's infinite and goes on and on and on. So eventually, those who don't understand will come to understand. What I am trying to, and I agree with you, there is no end, there's no beginning. So what's the point? Uh, the point is that if you don't know uh, it con con conventionally that there is no end and no beginning in conventional terms, and uh, then you cannot uh, somehow, that's what I postulate, uh, reality is not able to be itself directly like a tooth cannot bite itself. Let's put it that way. It needs another, it needs another tooth to, to, to bite onto something. So the pure being is unaware, unaware of its own being. And if it was not through this uh, going to this direct uh, experience, uh, it's it's uh, it doesn't make any difference because at the point where reality experiences itself directly, there is no knowing, there is no thinking, there is no nothing. There's direct experience, so it takes a little bit of non, 100% pure being in order to know. Hey, I am being. See, that's what I mm -hmm. that's what I'm trying to say. Oh, I, so I totally I do. I totally it takes, get what you're saying. It takes a little totally bit of like ignorance. It. it takes a little bit of ignorance to to somehow into it because it's an intuition it's not an understanding it's a direct being uh, of of non uh, non ignorance which is uh, uh, a, a panya uh, absolute wisdom and so one cannot be without the other that's what i'm saying now how long how long that uh, that uh, distance is between zero and one how how uh, uh, difficult it, it it is to get to you know that panya, that uh, samadhi, that uh, direct experience fr coming from a non-direct experience. I suspect that it takes uh, lifetimes. <laughs> like they say, you know, it, it takes lifetimes. It's always happening in a sense. So basically, each individual consciousness is a chance for reality to uh, experience itself directly. But it, it does that one consciousness at a time. That means one ignorance at a time. That's, that's my, that's my uh, hypothesis, at least. And the, the fact that this consciousness is aware of that, that there is a direct experience of reality, the, the fact that this, this consciousness can say, I am the whole of reality, talking about itself right now, 
that carries a lot of weight. And uh, without this mind thinking that, uh, that very deep direct experience would be lost because reality does not know. So I am the instrument through which reality is able to feel like I am every freaking thing and nothing at the same time. Isn't that beautiful? Reality cannot do that without this consciousness. And I am it thinking about itself. So the moment that I don't have an identity about myself, I, I, I know Atman is Brahman, Brahman is Atman. This is, this is the whole thinking about itself with this very subtle abstraction. That's the beauty of it. The, the, the more you get, the closer you get to non-being, because that's the absolute being. Brahman is non-being. But the being is the aspect of Brahman. So the closer ignorance comes to non-being, so that, you know, avijja becomes vijja, it becomes panya, mm -hmm. that experience, the very point, the, the getting to the other shore is that incredible sense of, oh my, oh my. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're you know. in total agreement. But we, you see, but, see, I'm saying that journey that you described is going within towards yourself. Yes, that's, yes. that's the only thing I'm saying. And, so and there how is no that, six, Yeah. How long well, it takes to get to that point is that's where I think that it takes time. It just doesn't happen like that. I mean, yeah, some people that, may... That depends on karma. You know, you know, on, on what your when soul you, needs to go through and learn in order when to... You went to, to India, when you went to India and you were presented with those concepts and all of a sudden the, the, the light bulb went off, that was instant, instantaneous. Mm -hmm. But there was, a, there was a trip before that where the, mm -hmm. the, the, the light was not, you know, lit up no you see, that's, that's, that's that that's not that's what i learned the only thing that changed was my perception that it wasn't off and then it was on i know i, I know, realized I know, that it was it was always on i i know and I know. the only thing that changed was my perception of that yes and when i but, say perception i'm talking yes. about the mental perception yes but reality is always on yeah exactly the, the soul is always but it doesn't know it Hmm? It doesn't know it. You see, because it, I say the, 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 is that the soul does know it. It's the mind that doesn't know it. And you see, you, and, when you, and, and, and the thing is, the mind is a necessary tool. All right, let's rephrase this. this. Let's rephrase it. The mind knows it in, if the mind knows it. Uh, the uh, soul knows it if the mind knows it. So it goes together. It, it, the, the soul does not know unless the, its mind, because it's the mind of the soul, knows it so it goes together because it here transcendentally the soul does not know the the soul is but it doesn't know it and it's through the mind that it is able to discover itself that's why you you know yourself you go in know those know thyself the reality is knowing itself through its own mind but it needs the mind to know itself and this mind has to change <laughs> from very ignorant to extremely subtle and enlightened in order for the reality to become one. So I, we are talking about the same thing, absolutely. Uh, so it happens all the time and it's been happening for infinity and eternity. This, this yin yang is eternal. Yeah, so, I agree with and, that. So, uh, and, so reality is it, but it doesn't know it. And every so often, like the turtle, you know, coming out to breathe and putting the mm -hmm. the, the head through the uh, the buoy. Uh, I I think that description is a little bit uh, in my favor. That reality knows itself a hundred percent only through a few little minds. That's that's what I think. Because if if it were the case, then everybody around us would be enlightened. We we, we could talk about this at uh, Walmart, and everybody yeah. would understand yeah. what we're saying. Everybody is enlightened. Like I said, the only the only difference is that the veil is down. <laughs> they just now don't know that no, they are enlightened. Yeah, they just, just don't know it. that. Let's put it this way: that if enlightenment is the soul itself, it, it, you know, it's an identity, uh, then uh, uh, it doesn't know that the reality doesn't know itself clearly through every mind. So that's the thing. This every mind uh, assumes that there's the work to be done. It's, it just doesn't happen like that. There are billions of people, but reality only knows itself very clearly through a few minds. I, I think we, we can agree on that.
Oh, I don't disagree with anything you said. I'm okay. just saying if that's if that approach works for you, that's absolutely fine. Keep going. It buddy. works for me. Knock yeah. yourself yeah. out. Yeah, exactly. Through through this Knock my reality. Through this my reality is extremely happy. Yeah. So that's like I said, like like, like you know, like I said, I it's their own. Any approach that resonates with you and you follow, no matter what that approach is. Like I gave the analogy of my friend who struggled with addiction, found Jesus, found the church, completely turned his life around. What's wrong with that? Sure. Nothing. That's right, because that's where he's supposed to be. So yeah. anyway, like I said, you know, God bless you. Knock yourself out. If that's how you want to see things and present it and you can help people along their path, God bless you. More power to you. It's not about, uh, you know, that it's not about right or wrong. You see, it's, it's we're not about it's not about um, which way is better, which way is that. It's like which way works, and that can only come down to where an individual is at. How I see it, karmically. Yeah, yeah. Because, like I said, the aha moment I had was the fact that everything I've been looking for, I already had. I felt like Dorothy with the slippers at the at the end of Wizard of Oz. Yeah. There's no place yeah. like home. Home being the Atma. Home being the soul. You always had the well, way home, you see? So that's that's just the way I look at it, and I see it, and I present it. If that resonates absolutely. with people, fine. If it doesn't, absolutely. fine. That All being right. said, brother, I really appreciate this talking. I'll see you next week. Um, I got yeah. out of here. I got to go clean a Confederate cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, for, guys, it was, thanks for it coming, was very enjoyable. Man. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Heido, make sure that you, uh, you uh, share the link. And that you share the link so we can share it up there uh, and and Rami and for Mike. Brahman to see. It was good. Thank you very much. I'm out of here. See you next week. See you next Bye. week. Bye. Bye. That was pretty good, Hiro. Good. Yes. Bunch of. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so you can uh, check out the links in the chat. I'm going to save the chat right now. And I will click on the, uh, the the last thing that you shared. Woo! Right. A lot of, uh, a lot of still on. material to cover. Now he's gone. And you've put new things in, so this is wonderful. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I created a little podcast, and I forgot the how to log in though. The, my password, so I I'll recover my reset my password. And from, uh, from the browser, but it's on my phone. Okay, and I know you've got some material between May 31st and June 27th. Oh, I do? You mm -hmm. do, because you, they're, they're, you've you been holding these almost every Saturday morning. Oh, yes, I should put this on the, uh, well, next next Saturdays, I should put this on Central Florida also. I, I put it on, on Buddhism for happiness. At yeah. least a link in the discussion area. Nine thirty. I have to take my mother to an appointment. It was very good seeing your face and yes, uh, thank you part of this. Thank for you for joining us for good another night. Saturday morning live. We wasted all that time. Another two hours wasted. <laughs> <laughs> have a great rest of your day. Come on, Bye. Not.